brought to you by Best Movie Ratings. Best Movie Ratings is a one-stop, easy and elegant movie ratings experience. Stop wasting your time on bad movies and download the world's best movie ratings app from the iTunes App Store now. Hi everyone, this is Ahmed Karimli and welcome to Be Efficient TV. The mission of this web TV show is to boost the efficiency of your business and life through tips and tricks from leading experts. And today I have with me Dr. Len Phillips. He is an award-winning schooler. He is an executive educator and customer value delivery. And he is the founder and managing director of Reinventures. Ventures. Welcome to the show, Dr. Phil. Dr. Phillips. Hi. It's great to be here, Ahmed. It's my pleasure. You never planned to be a professor. Can you take us through this interesting journey and your background? Sure. Um, I just recently wrote a uh, commencement speech at my alma mater for my twin brother, uh, Lane Phillips, who's a, a famous for former federal judge and uh, United States attorney appointed by Ronald Reagan and, and George Bush. And in the commencement speech, I, I started out with the introduction of both of us um, from an article uh, that was written about us when we were 13 years old in Oklahoma City Times. And we were interviewed just after playing in a table tennis tournament, believe it or not. And it was the second or third table tennis tournament in which we both made it to the finals. And the article was asking us both about what we wanted to be when we grew up. And my twin brother said he wanted to be a, a commercial artist. And I said that I wanted to be a construction worker. And, I, and I'm sort of reminded now of thinking back to the movies in Star Trek where Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock go back in time and try to change history. And I think had the, um, had, I think had the crew from the Starship Enterprise gone back in time and spoke to us when we were 13 years old and told us both what we were going to be, we'd have both just laughed our, our, uh, our hearts out and said that can never happen. He could never be a, a, a judge and a, a later go on to be a famous mediator. I would never go on to be a Harvard or Stanford professor. But what actually happened was is that we went to school in uh, University of Tulsa, that was our alma mater, and uh, we both were on scholarship. My twin brother was on a tennis scholarship. I was on an academic scholarship. Um, we both came from modest families, so our only way to go to school was through scholarship. When we graduated from undergraduate, my twin brother got a scholarship to go to law school. I also wanted to go to law school, but I applied to several schools, and although I got in, I didn't get a scholarship. Interestingly enough, my professors in the business school at the time said, why don't you apply for a PhD in business? And so at their urging, I did. And fortunately, I not only got into business school, I got into a PhD program in business school, and I got into one of the best ones at Northwestern's Kellogg Graduate School of Management. So basically, I followed that career path because it was the only career path that was available to me. It was the only scholarship that I got to go to graduate school. And interestingly enough, I was not admitted in the first round. I was actually admitted as an alternate after five other people had been accepted. One of them didn't accept, and I later got in. So it was unusual that I went in. But when I went into the school, I did great. I made like 52 straight A's in all the classes that I took. I graduated at the top of my class, and I got a job at Stanford afterwards as a professor. And so it was sort of an unusual journey to becoming a professor at a leading business school at a leading university. I later went on to teach at Northwestern, where I was there my last two years in the PhD program. I also was a visiting professor at Harvard. I was on the faculty at the University of California at Berkeley and also at Rice. But my longest stint was at Stanford. And so that's sort of the journey by which I ended up being a business school professor. And, and now, of course, I'm, I'm no longer full-time faculty, but I do executive education and consulting for companies worldwide. So is it a PhD from the beginning, how it works, or, or, the, or you have to finish a bachelor degree and you go to the PhD? Because what I understood that it's a PhD from the, from the beginning. Yeah, it's, 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 very, it's very interesting you ask that question. First of all, most people who get a PhD usually get master or master's degrees first and then go on to a PhD. I actually entered directly into the PhD program directly out of undergraduate. I was fortunate. Uh, I had also finished number one. Uh, in my class, an undergraduate, my twin brother finished number second, by the way. It's the only time I think I've ever beat him in my life at anything. But when I entered, they allowed me to enter directly into the PhD program at Northwestern. And what they told me was is that in the event I didn't graduate with a PhD, they would grant me the master's degree. But if I went straight through and got the PhD, they would grant me the terminal degree, the PhD. And actually, I finished in five years and could have finished even sooner if I wanted to. Um, I'd completed all my coursework in three years and passed my written exam. But 
I wanted to stay on longer. I was young at the time. I was one of the youngest people to graduate and apply for a job at Stanford. At the time I actually was hired there, I was uh, the age of the average student, 26 years old. And so I wanted to stay a little bit longer at Northwestern and practice teaching and, and really make a run at getting a job at one of the best business schools. And fortunately, I was able to. So it's five years master and then three years PhD? No, it's five years total for the PhD. And I never got granted a master's degree. They only granted me the terminal degree. But many people would probably spend two years getting a master's degree, then another four years getting a PhD, sometimes five. But I went straight through in five from undergrad all the way to PhD. And I could have even done it sooner if I wanted to, but I wanted to stick around Northwestern and, and uh, hone my skills as a teacher before I went out looking for a job. Tell us more about your Indian heritage. Ah, well, I, I'm Indian, but with quotes on it is the best way to, to put it. Uh, first of all, my wife, Anjali Lakwar, is Indian. Her parents are from Delhi and also from Kashmir. And uh, consequently, um, my son and daughter, uh, Cole and Anya, are also half Indian. But I'm also Indian of a different type. Uh, I'm from Oklahoma, and uh, my dad... Uh, James Arthur Cole Phillips is some percentage Cherokee Indian. We're not actually sure how much because we never got to meet his mom and his dad. They died when he was very young. He was raised by his grandmother, Grandmother Reedy, but he was in the Oklahoma National Guard. He was in the Oklahoma 45th Infantry Division, also the 179th Battalion of the 45th Division. All of that was composed principally of Native Americans, and uh, he was proud of his heritage. Exactly how much um, uh, Native American I am, I don't actually know, but so I'm a combination of both Oklahoma Indian and Delhi Indian. In, in 2006, uh, you had a problem of uh, leukemia cancer. How did you tell us more about this experience? Yes, it was unusual. I'd actually just finished on going on safari in Namibia with my two children. At the time, uh, interestingly enough, I was in just spectacular health. I'd been uh, training a lot for squash. I'd been training a lot for other sports. Um, I, I was maybe in the best physical condition I'd been since uh, since I was 25, 26 years old, and had really been working out hard. And uh, my doctor, shortly after coming back from safari, noticed an unusual blood chemistry uh, result in my blood chemistry test. I was actually getting ready to play in a squash tournament, and it was required for me to have a blood chemistry test before I went into it, as well as a, a cardio exam, etc. cetera. And, uh, and when I took it, I, I immediately got on a plane uh, to go to Australia, and by the time I got to Australia, my doctor called me and said, hey, you've got to come back. There, there's something really strange in your blood chemistry. You've got a really low white cell count. I actually blew it off because um, it's not unusual for endurance athletes to have low white cell counts, and, and i had been working out a lot, and I just thought it was a fluke. I actually didn't go back to see a doctor, unlike what he requested me to do, for almost two months. And when I returned to California after several business trips, he called me and, and urged me to go in again. I did Again, I had no symptoms. I didn't feel bad at all, but I went in and had the test, and sure enough, the doctor came back and told me, he said, you know, you shouldn't even be walking around. You don't even have a white cell count. Your, your white cell count's like 500. Normal male white cell counts between 4,000 and 10,000. He basically said, you have no immune system. They did a bone marrow biopsy on me that day. The next day I was diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia, and which is a very deadly cancer of the blood. At the time, it was killing about 85 out of 100 people inside of three years. Now, the good news is I had an identical twin. so. I had spare parts, I had spare cells. Basically, I was able to go through a bone marrow transplant, get my own cells back, and as a result, I had one of the fastest recoveries ever in the history of the hospital. I was uh, in and out of the bone marrow transplant inside of about three weeks, and uh, I'm now pronounced cured, and uh, I'm fine, and I, I will be able to complete this interview. <laughs> like, tell me when, when he told you that you, you have one year to, to survive, and, and what did you answer him? Or did you reply? Well, actually, it, was, it was worse than that. They, they told me that um, the only way you beat um, leukemia is to have a bone marrow transplant. And that while some people can beat it without that, it's very unusual because typically what happens is while the cancer is easy to put into remission uh, through chemotherapy and radiation, it typically has a very high incidence of recurrence and thus patients relapse and so thus the only way to really beat it is new cells and a bone marrow transplant but bone marrow transplants are risky bone marrow transplants 
if you're doing a transplant with a sibling, even if you have a sibling that's a donor, which is only a one out of four chance, the mortality rate's still in about the 25% range for that. Uh, if you're getting a bone marrow transplant from an unrelated donor, it can be about 50% mortality. But a transplant from a twin, a so-called syngeneic transplant, is actually very safe. It's only about a one to 2% mortality, but there's still risk and still odds. The problem was is that my doctor actually told me that she thought I was a high-risk patient, that my odds weren't 15 and 100 of survival in three years. She actually thought my odds were less than uh, five in 1,000. She thought I was a high-risk patient because she suspected I had a uh, precondition called myodysplasia, which puts me in a high-risk category. And I remember the day that she told me that. Uh, she said, uh, I think your odds are uh, five in 100. And I, and, I, and I said, doctor, I've never finished out of the top 5% in anything I've ever done in my life. I think we've got about a 2% cushion. And uh, she was there. And she just laughed out loud. She said, I think you'll be an interesting kind of patient. The good news was is that she was wrong. I wasn't a high-risk patient. I turned out to be a low-risk patient with a special chromosome inversion called chromosome inversion 16 that only a small percentage of the population has. So I, I just sailed through it. And it, you know, I look back on those times, and I actually think those were some of my best times. You know, My fight against cancer, my fight against leukemia, some of my best times. I don't regret it at all. You've been teaching teaching in the big like you know business schools like Stanford. You've also been teaching in Harvard. Uh, did did you start any entrepreneurial venture other than focusing on teaching and consulting for your through your company? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's important to remember that when you're at a university, especially at Stanford, especially at UC Berkeley, in your first years, it's largely what's called publish or perish. You're really writing articles for journals, really trying to hone your skills as a researcher, trying to, to make important contributions to important topics that are important to important people in business, whether academics or practitioners. So most of your first 10 to 12 years is devoted solely to that. It was at that time that I, I later decided that I wanted to start my own company. I wanted to do executive education and consulting full time. I'd already started in both Stanford as well as in, in other programs to teach executive executives and executive programs. And I really found that exciting and I wanted to do more of that as opposed to continue on in full-time MBA education. I enjoyed it, but I'd done enough of that by that point in time. I'd been on the faculty for a couple of years at Northwestern when I finished my PhD. I'd been on the faculty at Stanford for a while. So I started at my own company. I've had my own company since about 1992-93. But having said that, that's really my only entrepreneurial venture. But let me just say, I'm constantly involved as a partner in entrepreneurial ventures. So I probably worked for equity as a business partner in four or five startups. I helped one of my close colleagues um, start up a company. Uh, he managed it and ran it for 12 years. We later took it public on the newer market. Uh, I aided and abetted the, the whole process of gaining venture capital, of advising the company on its strategy and business plan. In fact, I'm working with that same entrepreneur right now in a new venture he has in digital locks uh, using uh, NFC, near field communications technology. So I'm constantly involved in entrepreneurial ventures, but typically for equity and not the founder per se. You mentioned that after the like PhD, you have to keep publishing. Usually, when you publish these papers or essays, or um, you publish it where? I just want the audience to understand. Sure. Well, when you're a faculty member, the the, the real incentive and control machinery at major universities is about publishing in refereed journals. That's what brings you prestige when, you, when you're actually coming up for reviews, say from assistant professor to associate professor, associate professor to full professor. They're, they're writing a group of your peers in the field and saying, how good is this person? How good are his articles? Are, are they leading articles in the field? Are they award winning, et cetera? But then after that, once you're doing the kind of stuff that I'm doing now, you're really not writing for refereed journals anymore. You might be writing for a, uh, an important business publication. You might be actually writing things on your own for clients. You might be writing things such as I recently authored with one of my colleagues, 30 e-learning modules really describing my intellectual property. They're available in five minute uh, little briefs uh, produced by one of my uh, former students' companies. Um, a gentleman who was the CEO of a UK media company, uh, United Business Media. And so I, I'm constantly still writing. I'm just not writing now for refereed journals, per se. 
you've been involved in many like you know top schools all over the world um, but most of the schools lacking of the entrepreneurship um, you know programs which schools that you can recommend to the audience to go to what the best entrepreneurial schools in the world well needless to say I'm biased in that regard and I believe that today that pinnacle um, and, a, and top school award it, it really goes to the school that has made the greatest contribution in that area for some time and that's Stanford University I mean if you just look at the track record the the track record of major founders um, coming out from Stanford Business School, Stanford Engineering School, Stanford Computer Science, uh, the founders of Google, founders of Sun, the founders of Cisco, the founders of Intuit, uh, the founders of Capital One. It, it's a long, long list. And the reason for that is, is that the school really has a unique relationship with Silicon Valley, in which it's located right in the middle of. Uh, the venture capitalists on Sand Hill Road, uh, on University Avenue. It, it's just an incredible environment for uh, spurring entrepreneurial thinking, entrepreneurial leadership. Y you have great mentors you can rely upon. It's really an unusual laboratory environment. But I would say that they face competition in the future. I wouldn't be surprised at all if we'll see similar kinds of environments coming from China, coming from India, uh, et cetera. So while there's many great schools that do focus on entrepreneurialism and innovation and new game thinking, I would say Stanford ranks the highest. It's an unusual confluence of not only faculty, but also entrepreneurial leaders, as well as uh, the vessels for capital for making entrepreneurial companies. Very unusual environment. How much their programs cost, like bachelor program or MBA? Well, first of all, Stanford doesn't have an undergraduate business school. It only has a graduate business school. And the percentage of, of coursework that's more entrepreneurial in nature, I'm not exactly sure what it is now in the new curriculum, but many of the projects that people do before they graduate have to do with entrepreneurial ventures. And I was just writing, writing today a, a recommendation for someone who's entering the school as a joint program. The business school partners with other parts of the school, and this particular individual was actually trying to enter the the joint program in business as well as in education with the sole purpose of bringing entrepreneurial Silicon Valley new game thinking to the whole area of um, higher education especially university administration so it's it's definitely a focus of the school much more so than it is of other major business schools Stanford has a small entering class relative to many other business schools there's a lot of emphasis on entrepreneurialism you have speakers coming from the Silicon Valley environment whether it was a Steve Jobs or whether it was um, uh, the CEO of Intel or what have you it's just a very very unusual kind of laboratory environment for entrepreneurial thinking and entrepreneurial education. Let's move deeper in, in your area of expertise. Uh, what are the main aspects of creating a customer-centric uh, enterprises? Yes, you know, I started teaching um, on this topic when I was at Stanford. I, I actually was teaching a class that was a capstone elective, which had the title of Building Market-Focused Organizations, and it later went on under other titles such as building uh, market focused and customer centric enterprises, et cetera. But having said that, the, the, the real heart of this is, is I think best stated by Jeff Bezos. Um, and, and I would urge all of your listeners to actually take a look at, at another great interviewer like yourself, Charlie Rose, and his interview with Jeff Bezos. And that's a fascinating interview. And right at the outset, he asked Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, you know, what are the things that really characterize what's unique about Amazon? And I think that his three answers probably get at what, what is the heart of a customer-centric enterprise. And it's mainly about mindset, it's about DNA, it's about the organizational culture. And he says three things. He says, first of all, that Amazon, since they've been in business, ha has tried to be unique in three areas. Number one, he says they're customer-obsessed, not competitor-obsessed. He says we quote unquote, start with the customer and think backwards. And then he says, secondly, we really value invention and innovation. We strongly believe that while we start with the customer, we simply don't listen to the customer and do what they say. We start with the customer and try to be innovative, try to be pioneers, try to be disruptive, try to bring solutions to customers that transcend what they can imagine. And then the third piece he says, which is quite interesting, he says, is long-term thinking. 
he says, you know, we're not obsessed by quarterly earnings. We're really interested in innovation that delivers profitable value over the long term. And I'd say those three traits that characterize Amazon would be those three traits that characterize most customer-centric enterprises. What are the best practices and tool sets to, for any company to achieve that? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, a great question, and that's really the heart of my practice. I, I'm hired really to do two things. I'm hired to introduce best practices in becoming customer-centric, best practices in what I call customer experience engineering, and then secondly, to help organizations embed and institutionalize those practices and, and produce superior business outcomes from doing so. Um, the, the, the concept of being customer-centric and the tools that are relevant to that I think about in terms of four key tools that I co-developed with colleagues of mine that I was working with when I was at Stanford. And those those four key tools have become, I'd say, four of the top 10 business concepts, both in strategy and execution, used by leading edge enterprises today. And there's almost no company that I go into in which I don't see these ideas already used. And I try to take their their practice and using them to a higher level. Those four concepts basically are, first of all, customer value proposition. It, it simply states this, any business offers up a proposition to the customers it serves in the market spaces and segments in which it competes for dollars and preferences. We say simply, choose a value proposition. Choose the combination of experiences and price, which if we deliver to some customer segment and some market space, we win. What's new about that concept is not that a business delivers a value proposition. What's new is about consciously, explicitly, deliberately choosing it and then using it, using it as a touchstone to drive all elements of the business. That, that notion of all elements of the business is best captured by the, the second concept, which we call value delivery system. That's the execution engine of a business. It simply says that all aspects of the business, all products, all services, all assets, all resources, all marketing and sales communications materials, um, all organizational infrastructure and supporting organizational machinery has to echo and reflect the chosen value proposition. If it doesn't, we're not engaged in flawless execution. So make sure every element of the business system echoes and reflects the value proposition and how we bring it to market and how we convincingly communicate it to customers. That's in essence what many people call business model. Um, the third concept is called Ditlock, um, unusual, it says, it, it's spelled D-I-T-L-O-C, and what it stands for is Day in the Life of Customers. And Harvard Business Review even made a film on how to spend a day in the life of the customer that was based on our concepts and utilizes our concepts in the context of a case study of an organization that used them to turn around their business. But Day in the Life of the Customer really speaks to a, a fundamental issue in business, which is where do great customer value propositions and business models, value delivery systems, come from? They don't come from asking what customers want. They come from, if you will, studying customers, almost like an anthropologist, making a movie of their life, almost like Steven Spielberg, stepping back with the expertise of a multifunctional team, not just marketing, not just sales, but all the functions of the business, engineering, operations, um, legal, compliance, supply chain, logistics, creatively inferring an improved scenario for customers that transcends what they can imagine. And when you take that approach, to immersing yourself in the day in the life of the customer as a multifunctional and sometimes even cross-business team, you come up with ideas that customers can never come up with. If you just ask customers what they want, they will ask you to do things that are unactionable and unprofitable. And of course, the real challenge with asking customers what they want and simply listening to the voice of the customer is, is that often they don't know what's possible. And day in the life of the customer methodology gets beyond that. The, the fourth concept is what we call value delivery chain. And it really refers to the customer value delivery chain. And, and it really speaks to organizations that compete in complex customer communities. So for example, as you know, I was just in the UAE working with Etisalat, and they recently won a big contract with Thomson Reuters for ICT solutions, uh, enterpri enterprise information communication technology solutions. You know, Will the real customers please stand up inside Thomson Reuters, whose day in the life we have to understand to deliver a superior value to Thomson Reuters and win their business through a large scale contract? Customers exist at multiple levels of that enterprise. There's strategic sponsors, there's people in procurement, there's people who actually use the solutions. This is about navigating the customer value delivery chain to understand which customers are most crucial to our success. 
even an Edis Lots consumer business, they actually deal with customers through distribution channel partners who are also customers and also candidates for a value proposition. So the customer value delivery chain reflects the fact that any business typically reaches its end user communities through a chain of customers to deliver value. And it's mapping that chain, navigating that chain. I, I urge business teams to be like Indiana Jones. Go out and navigate the unexplored links of the customer value delivery chain to uncover new ideas for innovation. So th those four concepts really are the, the tool sets that I think make up the four pillars of great customer experience engineering. And if you look at the Zen masters of, of who's done that, the Apples, the Amazons of the world, they, they've mastered all of those link, all of those four concepts of what I call customer experience engineering. But don't you think like I've heard one time Apple saying that uh, sometimes we offer the customers things that uh, never been theirs because they don't know what they want. Not always the customers knows what they what they want. So we offer them things that they never expected to have. Yes, I mean that's the essence of what Ditlock, Day in the Life of the Customer, insights and methodology is supposed to do. Steve Jobs was once quoted by a journalist uh, when he he was asked uh, what consumer research did you do to guide the development of the iPod, and he remarked, none, it's not the consumer's job to tell us what they want. And he goes on, however, from that comment, which is sort of often taken out of context and made to leave the impression that Apple engages in customer free thinking. He goes on to actually talk about, look, of one of our most successful products ever in the history of the company, perhaps the most successful up till 2004, 2005, the Macintosh, not a single customer ever requested any of the most popular top 10 features of Macintosh. He goes on to say, how can customers tell you what they want and what you're designing as something so far removed from their reality? But that doesn't mean that you engage in customer free thinking. Much of the, the, the commentary uh, about the very formation of Apple was simply Apple studying the videotape of the day in the life of a desktop computer user trying to access the application power of a computer using MS-DOS software on a PC. And they readily concluded, as did most, that it was like an Italian comedy. It was typically very hard for most people. And that they said as a strategic vision to try to make that easier, to give people surprisingly easier access to the application power of a computer so they can accomplish their in-state goals better. But competition's not supposed, the customer's not supposed to tell you how to do that. And they're not supposed to tell you how to do that. That simplifying insight, though, came from studying customers. So that's what, you know, what, he, what he's getting at here is he's not saying that we should, that asking customers what they want is evil and sinister. He's just simply saying that they can't tell you what to do because they don't know what's possible. When you work with companies, from where do you start to design a customer-centric company? Um, you really start with mindset. I mean, the first and foremost issue is mindset. And mindset depends on the historical evolution of the company. So for example, at a Salat, Edisalat is a, a fabulous enterprise, very, very much a leading edge a pioneer in mobile networks, received many awards for that. But if you went back in time in the history of the company, you would see that most of the mindset was what might be described as more inside out than outside in. It, it starts with uh, being engineering driven, being technology driven, in part because that is actually what was required at that stage of the evolution of the enterprise. Start with getting out the network, rolling out the network, making sure it's reliable, making sure it's available, telling customers about the value of the network, starting with, if you will, the technology and not the customer. And that was appropriate at that time. But as my work revealed in interviewing the chief marketing officer, the chief sales officer, the chief business officer, the world has changed on them. The world is, is changing on them in terms of a series of new competitors, a series of discontinuities in technology. That, that's meaning that they have to really start with what Jeff Bezos talked about, starting with the customer, the customer experience. What unusual, great, valued experience could we bring to the customer that we could uniquely brand, could uniquely own? And then thinking backwards from that to what we have to look like and how we have to shape ourselves to deliver it. That difference between inside out and outside in is the first and foremost challenge you have to deal with in many scientific and engineering companies. And so I say start with mindset first. Where are we at in the evolution to becoming a truly customer-centric enterprise? Start there. How to measure the customer-centric growth? 
Well, it, it really depends, again, on the company. So I, I've done quite a bit of work in, let's just take a, a space as an example, in aerospace, defense, national security. One of my large engagements was, was with Lockheed Martin. I've later gone on to work with General Dynamics. I've gone to work on with uh, Lidos, with SAIC, uh, with Northrop Grumman, with other companies that compete for large military as well as commercial contracts. And often I'm asked to simply take those four concepts I told you before, customer value proposition, value delivery system, a day in the life of the customer community, customer value delivery chain, and incorporate them directly into what would be referred to as their capture, new business capture processes, and keep sold processes. Keep sold is about keeping the contracts you've already won. And the idea here is how can we increase our contract win rates how can we improve our contract execution by incorporating those concepts? And, and so when you're competing on a large contract, let's say GPS-3, in which Lockheed Martin wrote a 70,000-some page proposal to the government, it's really important in the executive summary to actually lay out and convincingly communicate your value proposition. What combination of experiences and price are you offering the government versus, say, the competitor Boeing and its team of partners? The rest of the 70,000 pages is not just about elaborating on that promise, although that is required, quantifying it, et cetera. It's about really showing how we're going to deliver it through the value delivery system. Here's our technical volume, our, our cost volume, our management volume. And the customer community, when they evaluate your proposal, it consists of a source selection committee from people at multiple levels of the enterprise. There's people from procurement, there's people who are users, there's people who are sustainment and logistics officials. Uh, there's people who are uh, responsible for regulatory oversight. And they need to look at that proposal and bang the table and say, these people understand me and my role and our mission, and they get it. And, and so that whole concept of of putting those ideas in place should have a measurable impact on contract win rates and on contract execution and on customer satisfaction with contract execution. So for those clients, I actually measure what's the increase in contract win rate. And in particular, since many factors can affect contract win rate, besides just um, you know, were we involved in introducing these concepts, we go back and actually interview the capture managers directly and ask how much did it help for the team to align around a superior value proposition and, and communicate it in every volume of the proposal. So we do it with both quantitative data as well as qualitative data. Now, if it's not about large contracts and it's consumer business, we often look at other indicators. It might be customer satisfaction scores or net promoter scores. But uh, depending upon the company, there's always a set of metrics by seeing did this thought process, did this set of value delivery concepts in customer experience engineering, did it add measurable value to the enterprise in their objective to deliver profitable value? But do you think is creating a customer-centric company uh, is the main factor to sustain growth in the information age? You know, that's a great question. and I, I actually teach quite a bit on that these days. I, I often comment that most people who went to business school 15 years ago didn't get exposed to what it is that, that I think I and my colleagues who teach these ideas really represent today. I, I remember when I was going through business school and even doing my dissertation, the popular competitive advantage theories at the time, the ones that people were most interested in studying and mastering, had to do with things like competitive advantage as a function of building a defense against the five competitive forces, the interesting of which, one of which was the customer. The customer in part was the enemy, capable of bargaining away our rate of return. Um, other perspectives on competitive advantage really emphasize that companies who out earned the industry average tended to have things like size and scale and brand equity and brand awareness and, and long track records of incumbency and past performance track record and uh, breadth of product portfolio and, and uh, extent of geographic footprint. And of course, over the last 10 years, there's been a new age that's happened. I mean, had you, had you gone into Sony in 2002 and told them about the future, had you gone into Motorola and Nokia and Best Buy and Circuit City and told them by the year 2012 they'd all be disrupted by a company called Apple Computer, which at the time was largely characterized by mediocre products, bloated inventories, etc. I don't think you would have been able to change history following the logic of Mr. Kirk and Mr. Spock going back in time. 
I think they would have had a hard time believing that their formidable measures of competitive advantage along traditional lines would fall to a competitor who, who really was armed with this mindset that I just described, that, that was characterized in their approach to disrupting the dominant incumbents by things like speed, timing, innovation, customer experience engineering. And I think those examples I just cited there are one of not a few examples, but one of 50 examples I can cite. To just imagine going to IBM in 2002 and telling them that by the year 2012, they'd lose a $600 million contract to a company called Amazon, uh, to the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, who hires Amazon instead of IBM to put in place a cloud services infrastructure, not only for them, but for the 16 other federal intelligence agencies. You just imagine them saying, are you talking about that little company in Seattle that sells books online out of a warehouse? You'd say, yep, yeah, that's the one. And you just see example after example after example after example that says the nature of competitive advantage has changed in the last 10 to 15 years. It's companies that are quickly able, based upon day in the life of the customer insights, to choose and deliver winning value propositions that are highly innovative, that go far beyond what customers can imagine, create a unique branded experience that disrupts the dominant incumbent. You see that again and again and again. I think we're in a new world. What are the questions that any business should answer to commit a customer value proposition? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question too. And, and you know, many people think that value proposition is like a message tagline, um, such as an Eda Salat. Their message tagline, which is a good one, is about we extend people's reach and and we empower and extend. Um, um, the ability of small to medium enterprises in the UAE, all, all of that is great, but it's really more advertising. And when I talk about a value proposition, I talk about the upfront strategic architecture of a business plan. So a business plan for any company, whether it's an entrepreneurial company or a large scale enterprise that competes in multiple segments and spaces, always has to start with, what's the market space we're targeting with growth? What's the segments we're targeting for growth? Now, within those segments that we're targeting for growth, what's the value proposition and value delivery system that we're going to implement to win? And a good value proposition, thus, as an upfront strategic architecture, is not a messaging or tagline. It's not 20 words that we're going to put to music and that we're going to, to rhyme and, and all sing and hold hands about. It's an answer to six tough questions. Number one, what's the intended time frame for this value proposition? Are we writing the three-year plan or the five-year plan? If it's a three-year plan, well, then we can do more in three years probably than we can do in five years. If it's a one-year plan, you know, that constrains us. We only can articulate what is the value we're going to deliver over the next year. And, of course, I'm a big advocate of actually writing a three- to five-year plan that says it's got subcomponents. Here's what we're going to do in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. The second question beyond intended time frame, are we working on a short-term or long-term plan, is who's the intended target customer segment? And here we have to describe the target customer segment, not just in the usual demographics. We have to describe their, if you will, day in the life of the customer profile. What, what's the set of problems and frustrations and unmet need states and occasions that this segment has that's unique? And by the way, what's their size and growth potential that makes them a lucrative target for us to go after? There's a third piece that actually says, what are we proposing? What do we want this segment to do? It's not just buy our product and service, is it? Isn't there a piece here that says, first of all, they need to become aware of what we offer. Maybe they try some of our stuff at the outset, if you will, a get-in value proposition that could lead to a stay-in and grow value proposition. What is it we're proposing? Are we proposing they just buy a product, a combination of products, that they engage in a relationship with us that, that perhaps develops over 12 months? What are we proposing is an important element of a customer value proposition. Then the, the fourth piece is, what are the best perceived alternatives? Who are we up against? If the customer doesn't do what we propose, what will they do? And best perceived alternative is not necessarily a direct competitor. It can be, they won't do anything. They'll persist in their status quo. The, the fifth component of a value proposition says, what unique customer experiences are we gonna deliver to that customer community? What specific measurable events we make happen in their lives with what consequences of value in comparison to the best competing alternatives, both benefits as well as equal experiences and trade-offs. And then the final piece is about price. 
What's the price that customers have to pay to get that set of experiences from us versus the competing alternatives? And of course, the idea about this is, if you answer all six of those questions, you've got a complete value proposition. If you write just a message tagline, you can't assess, would that really be superior? So, so consider uh, Southwest Airlines' original value proposition, <coughs> offering frequent business travelers in the state of Texas uh, the following. It, it asks them to fly Southwest instead of fly Braniff or drive a car between Dallas and Houston. Um, the experiences are you'll save about an hour door to door and you'll get a 30% lower price close to the cost of driving, but you'll have to trade off full service. You'll have to trade off assigned seats, meals, interline ticketing, interline baggage handling in order to get that set of experiences. And of course, this is the classic cruel to be kind of business in which by denying customers full service on a 45 minute flight, which they don't need, they can give customers more of what they really want, saving time and cost. And just ask yourself, is there a segment who would trade off assigned seats and meals and interline ticketing and interline baggage handling on a 43 minute flight to save about an hour door to door and get a lower price, 30% lower than competing alternatives close to the cost of driving? I just described the most profitable airline business model of the last 30 years. And no customer will ever suggest that. No customer will ever suggest that. But there are sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters of Southwest on every continent on the planet Earth, including, by the way, United Arab Emirates, which we see fly Dubai, Air Arabia, etc. So that whole notion of write a complete value proposition, address those six questions, really key. What is VDS? VDS is simply value delivery system. It, it, as I was trying to indicate earlier, it's the execution engine of the business. It, it says, what are the problems we have to solve and the processes we have to re-engineer and the capabilities we have to build to deliver that value proposition and to deliver it profitably. So in the Southwest example, one of the things they had to master was how do we turn planes at the gate in 10 to 15 minutes and still be equally as safe as the safest airline? If we could do that, we could fly with fewer aircraft than our competitors. We'd have much greater productivity in using the key asset of the airline, which is the plane, which costs $55 million for a new 737. And the idea here is, is that if you can be more productive in using that asset, you can charge a lower price and still make money. But how do you solve that problem? Well, you solve that by denying customers assigned seats and meals and interline ticketing and interline baggage handling so you can turn planes faster. You also solve it by flying only one kind of aircraft, 737, etc. So the whole notion of the value delivery system is about execution. What do we have to look like? How do we have to shape ourselves in every asset, in every resource, in every acquisition, in every partnership, in every sales and marketing and social media communications vehicle to deliver that value proposition, to get customers to store it in long-term memory and use it as a basis for decision making. How do you engage with the clients that you serve and what's a typical engagement like and how long does it take? Well, the answer to that question is that it depends on clients, but there's always two components of any engagement. Number one, there's typically a component on executive education and that's about mindset setting. It comes back to what is the mindset of the customer centric enterprise and how does that stack up versus the mindset that's in this enterprise? and in the heads of the different people and pivotal jobs throughout the enterprise. How is it the mindset that I'm teaching by which customer-centric enterprises operate fundamentally different from what's going on in the enterprise today? You have to have that as a foundation. From then you have to write, you have to move into implementation guidance and, close, and coaching to close the gap between what's old and typical about their mindsets versus what's new and required. So as an illustration for Etta Salat, after teaching in uh, 12 different sessions in six different locations across the UAE for Etta Salat. I wrote up a set of, set of recommendations on where we could take this set of key frameworks, concepts, tool sets on customer experience engineering and apply them to actually produce a superior business impact for the enterprise. And so while I identified 15 areas in which we could work, we'll probably just pick some subset to start with as pilot projects to actually show what we can do, to show what we can um, help them succeed 
And those typical engagements in working with clients on implementation, coaching, and guidance, the length of them depends on what's their starting point, how far are they away from being a truly customer-centric enterprise, and it also depends upon the nature of the tasks that we get. Some of the tasks that we get coaching are very long-term engagements, some are not, some are very short-term engagements. But a typical engagement might be a year, a typically long-term engagement might be four years. Some of my clients I've worked with on an ongoing basis for, for 10 years. I've probably had an ongoing relationship at a company, Hewlett Packard, that exceeds 10 years. I've had relationships, however, that, that sometimes are a year in duration and then I'm out. Sometimes I, I feel like after three to four years in an enterprise, I've basically succeeded in embedding this set of ideas inside the institution. At Lockheed Martin, for example, I trained some 17 value transformation strategists, as they were called in the organization, to do this. And, and they carried on that work long after I was gone from the enterprise. So the real issue is embedding it in the enterprise, institutionalizing it in the enterprise. The question is, how long does that take? And it depends upon the starting point, and it depends upon the, the actual task we're given for embedding and institutionalizing. But the rough answer is engagements last about a year to four years. You work with many companies, small size, medium size companies, and big size companies, multinationals companies. From your experience, which one you think the best prov- that provi- provide the best customer experience? Well, of companies that I've actually worked for um, and, uh, and that I've engaged with, I would say, the, the companies uh, that I highlight are actually companies that I use in my illustrations. Uh, I talk about Apple and their customer experience, not just from the devices, but also from their in-store experience. And uh, I also had a large engagement uh, a number of years ago with FedEx, which I found to, to be a, also a leader in customer service. And I, I teach not only the precepts that emerge from the founding of their business, but also their transition to try to attack new market spaces, such as global supply chain optimization for large-scale enterprises, uh, the likes of which could be a Cisco or a Philips Semiconductor or Agilent Technologies. And, I, and I, I'm very, very impressed with the work that uh, those organizations have done, the experience they deliver. But outside of that, I'm also very um, I'm also very uh, influenced by organizations I haven't worked with. My My uh, second home here in Southern California is close to Disneyland, and I go to Disneyland all the time with my kids. And I'm just amazed at uh, the experience that they deliver, uh, especially even to this day when my kids are now 13 and 17. But I I remember remember distinctly when I would take my kids to Disneyland when they were much younger. And uh, and Disney's experience of of taking kids away to some faraway exotic place that they can't otherwise go and experiencing the mystery and fantasy and excitement of being in that place. I mean, they deliver that beautifully. You know, my my daughter doesn't come home from that when she's five years old and and say, you know, uh, we went to a place where a bunch of people that are adults dress up like a big mouse and a big dog and play pretend. You know, she thought she met, you know, Belle from Beauty and the Beast. She thought she met Mickey Mouse. So I'm very impressed by how they do that. That it's a it's a stellar example of customer service and, and customer experience engineering. You help big companies like win big contract. Is that by focusing only on customer experience or also on sales and marketing? Well, really, the, the whole process of winning big contracts is a sales and marketing and business development exercise, in some sense, because you have to write a response to a request for a proposal. So as I was mentioning earlier. If Lockheed Martin wants to win GPS-3, they're going to have to write a proposal that responds to the government-issued RFP uh, request for proposal. Now, of course, the real challenge is you don't wait till the RFP comes out. You actually start work on the customer value proposition long before the RFP comes out. So you can actually shape the customer community's issuance of the RFP. So when you respond to an RFP, you're basically responding to a song that you helped to write. But but the challenge here in in actually winning big contracts has to go beyond customer experience. As I mentioned, these these proposals, these responses to winning big contracts typically have two components to them that are crucial. Number one, you have to describe the customer value proposition that you're going to deliver. It has to be very clearly communicated. And in most RF responses to RFPs, you have to quantify the value proposition because the customer community gets lots of pre-RFP help on what it wants. What they have a harder time doing is actually measuring the value of what you and the competition are going to deliver. So if you focus there, you can win. But the promise is not enough. The, the, the government 
large-scale enterprise, they want credibility that you can actually deliver that value proposition. They want to see your past performance track record. They also want to see what solutions you're going to bring them and how many times you've brought those solutions before. And if you're bringing innovative solutions that, that really, really are game changers for the organization, they want some trust level that you can actually do it because the landscape is full of companies that overpromise and underdeliver. And so they want to avoid that. Their, their major concern is not just getting to their in-state goals and the acquisition, but getting a journey to those in-state goals that's reduced in time and cost and complexity and risk. And both the CVP, the customer value proposition, and the value delivery system have to reflect that. And then, of course, as I was saying, the major thing they have to conclude is that the CVP and the VDS were based upon imaginative insights of spending a day in their life that you know them, you know their mission, you know their goals, you know their challenges, and all of that has gone in. And, and I say if you do that, if you actually choose and commit to a value proposition and align a value delivery system around that and convince the customer community you're intimate with them and understand their challenges, even if you're up against another great company that's just as good as you, you're gonna win, because you're aligned. You're gonna communicate better, you're gonna communicate more convincingly, and even if they're just as good, from an engineering and technical standpoint, you're going to win. My experience is you win about 85% of the time. In plain English, can you tell us what is uh, Enterprise 2.0? Yeah, I Enterprise 2.0 is simply a, a term that was coined by a Harvard Business School professor to, to reflect really the, the challenge that enterprises face in incorporating social software platforms or social technologies into the enterprise. And there's really a purpose in doing this that's about collaboration. So there's two forms to that. One is for collaboration for, between employees and executives within the enterprise. And a typical application in our work is it's not enough just to choose the value proposition. I recently worked with an aerospace and defense client in which we had to figure out what value proposition were we uniquely going to bring the customer community that actually was an integrated value proposition that cut across our our four or five business units where, where if we combined and collaborated as business units, we could deliver a unique value proposition versus competition. We did lots of interviews with customers, lots of interviews with executives. And we put something on a internal wiki in which um, basically an internal social technology, social networking website. And there's many platforms for this. The particular one I'm talking about was Jive, in which we now started a st strategic dialogue across the enterprise of, is that the right value proposition? Is that what we should come to stand for? But what's good about that value proposition? What's dangerous and risky about that? And now you're starting to get people to ideate around that. So one element of Enterprise 2.0 is basically collaboration within the enterprise. And another area where we use it quite a bit is where we bring day in the life of the customer research back to the enterprise and we post it on an internal website and now we get ideation from multiple functions inside the enterprise to actually say here's how I'd make that better. Now there's another element of Enterprise 2.0 and that's between the enterprise and its customers, between the enterprise and its supply chain trading partners. And again, that in our business, in our practice, we're often using that to do things like okay, we, we've come up with a new value proposition concept by spending a day in the life of the customer that no customer could have come up with, but let's go validate that. Let's go test that. Let's go, let's go present that in concept description form by a web-based scenarios to customers directly and get their feedback on it and see what they think about it. So we use social technology for collaboration between the enterprise and its product development groups and customer communities they want to serve. And often we use it as a basis for trying to really understand better the day in the life of the customer communities that we serve. In fact, one of my clients, United Business Media, designed what was considered about a year ago one of the highest rated websites in the world um, on a number of dimensions, but especially value to the customer community. It's called onc.org, O-N-C.org. And it's basically a website for oncology nurses and oncology nurse practitioners. And it's an amazing website. Basically, oncology nurses globally go on the website and blog about best practices and what they've learned. Because cancer, as you know, with cancer becoming increasingly an individualized medicine, that the whole area of cancer is moving away from chemotherapy and away from radiation to individualized medicine, the equivalent of in Gleevec, um, 
a particular form of leukemia, now you can just take a pill and you're in remission for uh, 10 years. Much of medicine is moving that way. That presents new challenges for oncology nurses who, who now have to face different patients who need different kinds of help in using, using these new oral oncolytics. And that whole community is an amazing community in which, sponsored by a pharmaceutical client, they can actually study the day in the life of the customer just through those blogs. So it's those kinds of ideas, Enterprise 2.0, that really is about webifying the enterprise, leveraging the best of web-based technologies, in particular software uh, that is of a social media, social technology nature, uh, to deliver more profitable value. So that's what people are doing. Can you take us through the reinventure seven-phase engagement model? Yeah, the, the seven-phase engagement model really describes an approach in which uh, we start out with executive education. We then um, actually move into a set of uh, training modules on how to actually now go engage with customers through day in the life of the customer methodology. So there's an upfront piece that says we're going to actually uh, teach this mindset, get people to buy into this mindset, see that this mindset that we teach is not the dominant logic in the enterprise. But then we're going to move into implementation mode. We're going to prepare teams to go out and do day in the life of the customer research um, with a multifunctional team uh, guided by best practices and Ditlock methodology. Then there's a third stage that says, let's actually go do that research, and now let's let's bring that back and let's ideate on it. That's the third stage. The fourth stage is what we call customer value proposition and value delivery system. Uh, initial hypothesis, stake in the ground. What do we mean now about what we think is the value proposition and delivery system we have to implement to deliver profitable value, to drive profitable growth. Maybe it's not one, maybe it's several strategic options that emerge. That's sort of the fourth broad stage. The fifth stage has to do with, let's go out and let's test those strategic options some more. Those are the ones that emerge, but they're the vital few. Which one or one should we really pursue? What's the size and growth potential of each of those? Which one really looks like a winner? Which ones really look like a winner? And of course, we also have a follow-up stage in, in the sixth stage and we take the ones that really we winnow down and we do extensive validation and feedback on with customers back and forth in an agile process to get their feedback, tweaks, conditional choices to if we did this, would it be better? If we did this, would it be better? There's a final stage that involves simply roll out, roll out the uh, CVPs and the VDSs that um, we thought had the greatest merit, and let's go now follow them through and, and measure and monitor and adjust the CDP and VDS as we roll out. So we basically take people from the very early mindset stage all the way through rollout and implementation. At what point do you think Apple started understanding or becoming more customer-centric company than Amazon? In terms of like advertisement uh, well, campaigns, I don't, that, that they're, I don't know that they're more customer centric than Amazon. I, I would say that both of uh, both companies have taken a lot out of each other's playbook. I would say uh, the real comparison there is Apple versus its competitors, especially Apple versus Sony, Apple versus Kodak, Apple versus Best Buy, Circuit City, Motorola, Nokia, and, and I actually think that desperation. Um, it was the mother of invention for them. I think that um, they faced a crisis. I think that, that they pretty much concluded that their inside out mindset, which had done them pretty well, got them to 10, 15 billion dollars, was really not the mindset that was gonna get them to the future, as many entrepreneurial ventures actually come to that conclusion. And I'm reminded of a, a very interesting speech that Steve Jobs gave uh, at a developer conference in which he said, look, um, you know, the tendency that I had for many years was actually thinking inside out, starting with the technology and asking what value it can deliver to customers. And he said he's learned over time through the school of hard knocks, and he had more scar tissue, he said, to prove it than anybody else in the industry. That you have to start with the customer experience, and not the technology. What's the really unique customer experience that we could deliver? And then start to think backwards from that to the technology, but not just the technology to all aspects of the value delivery system. What we have to look like, how we have to shape ourselves in partnerships, maybe in acquisitions, what we have to look like and how we have to shape ourselves in our marketing communications. So, so I would say the turnaround of Apple was it was not something in which all of a sudden that they, they had finally hit their stride because they were always customer centric. I would say that it was an amazing turnaround in mindset 
in a period of what was great economic uncertainty. And I think it showed basically starting in the um, early 2000s straight on that that mindset had much greater wealth generation potential than their old mindset. What are the other projects that you're currently working on? Yeah, I'm, as I said, I, I'm, I'm constantly involved in a series of, of projects. Um, and most of the work right now that I do, um, 50% at least, is uh, overseas and in an emerging markets. So I have a, a large project that I'm working on um, in Saudi Arabia. I hope to be coming back soon to the work in the United Arab Emirates, not only with Maastricht Bank, but also with Etisalat. But I have projects ongoing in Europe. Next month, I'm in uh, I'm in Berlin for Novartis. I'm also um, engaged here in the United States with a large oil field services company called Baker Hughes. So, so my projects really vary quite dramatically. I'm often involved in in projects that deal with very large scale multinational enterprises trying to move into commercial markets. I'm also involved in working with entrepreneurial companies. Um, how usually like how usually most of your customers find you? Is it by referrals or uh, how do you market for yourself as a speaker and expert? Yeah, it's a great question. I've been very, very fortunate. I, I do very little marketing. I, I have clients come to me and ask for me for help. Clients who move from one company to another often ask me to come back and work with them. I get very little business just coming over the web from people who are unfamiliar with me. Um, and so most of my work comes from past work and past performance and past work. Sometimes I'll be referred to, um, I'll, I'll, I'll have a client who was referred to me by another client. But most of the work, I think, is just based upon past work that I've done for clients and clients moving on and, and, uh, and moving on to other jobs and asking me to come help them in their, their new roles. Who's your number one mentor? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, I think the answer to that question really, of course, varies at any stage of your life. Today, I'd say my number one mentor is my identical twin brother. And uh, he's a trusted advisor and a trusted counsel. And, um, and we've been close for, of course, many, many years. And I, I really do value his advice and counsel. And, and, but, you know, he wouldn't have been my number one mentor at other stages of my life. I mean, it, when I was growing up, my dad was my, my mentor and was a great coach and a, a great source of support. Uh, when I went to graduate school, my, my mentors, I had two key mentors in grad school, a, a professor named Lou Stern and a professor named Brian Sternthal that really influenced me and influenced my thinking. After grad school, when I was at Stanford, I would say I had a number of great mentors, the best of which was actually a former business partner of mine named Mike Lanning, uh, who really influenced my thinking, who really influenced uh, my teaching who really influenced many aspects of my business, more so than actually the other Stanford faculty that I worked with. Um, after I left Stanford, I would say that my, my mentors had been my, my clients. I mean, I, I learned so much from the uh, strategic sponsors who hired me at uh, Lockheed Martin, a gentleman named Stan Sloan, who really taught me the ropes of what's unique about aerospace, defense, military contracting, government spending. I, I learned a tremendous amount from Stan. So, you know, the the mentors change based upon who you're working with. My, my greatest mentor the last four years or so was my, my colleague in reinventors, Billy Mills, who's a former West Point graduate and IT system architect, who really helped me understand Enterprise 2.0, how it influences the concepts I teach. Incredibly valuable. but. But long-term mentor, my twin brother, Lane. In three words, the most important factors for success. You know, I believe always think backwards is a good motto. <laughs> it, it sounds, it, it just it just carries the, the, the right uh, connotation and it surprises people a little bit. But always think backwards. You know, first of all, when you start in business, start with a customer and always think backwards. Think backwards from them to what you have to look like and how you have to shape yourself to deliver value. But, but I think that's transcendent. It's not just in business, it's in relationships. You want to have a relationship with someone, you have to always think backwards. If you want to love somebody, if you want them to love you, you have to start with them and their circumstances and their unmet needs and occasions. And you have to think backwards. You have to always think backwards to what you'd have to look like, how you'd have to shape themselves yourself to meet their needs. And I, I really like that notion of always think backwards. So that, that would be my contribution to three words for success. What are the habits that you are trying to develop to stay efficient? 
Yeah, um, really two things that, that, uh, that I think actually you teach in some of your, your other interviews that I've looked at, some of my uh, readings of some of the things that are, that are key that, that you talk about. I would say in my business, the two things that are key is outsourcing and partnership. So again, um, there are things that I can outsource. I need to be spending more time on developing client work. I need to be spending time on actually making sure that client work is of a high quality. What I don't need to be spending a lot of time on is actually writing the proposals to win that work. I, I've got team members that I can outsource that to, and many of them have been with me for 17 years, and so they can complete any sentence that I start, and, and they're really terrific. One guy that I've worked with for a long time is, is just my right-hand person and, and really fabulous. Outsourcing is really key for doing work like writing proposals, graphics for classes, et cetera. It takes me out of that, allows me to focus more time on core activities. Uh, the, the, the second piece is partnering. Uh, my friend Billy Mills that I mentioned is just a great illustration of for me to be successful in the uh, evolving world of aerospace, defense, national security, which is increasingly net centric in an IT game, and to also be valuable in helping enterprises transition to Enterprise 2.0, you need somebody that really understands that entire spectrum technically very, very well. And he's just outstanding. I mean, he's he's probably taught me more than anybody's taught me the last five years. It's been fantastic. Um, he's, he's a young man, too. He's about 34, 35 years old. And, and uh, you know, you can never, you never have to, you can never stop learning, at least if you do what I do. What are the top three, your top three favorite books? Uh -huh. uh, my top three favorite books are, uh, first of all, I'm a lover of biography. So William Manchester's uh, books on uh, William Ch uh, on Winston Churchill are just fantastic and uh, the uh, and very inspirational. And I keep them front and center. I also love Edmund Morris's um, books on Teddy Roosevelt. I'm I'm very inspired by by both those historical figures. And then I guess I'd have to say the Bible. I think the Bible is an amazing story. I read read it all cover to cover when I was in the hospital, 18 months recovering from leukemia, and it's it really is an amazing story. So I'd I'd be remiss if I didn't add that to the list. Top three people that you're inspired by? Well, if I was going to go beyond Churchill and beyond Roosevelt, both of whom inspire me, I would say first and foremost, um, one of the people that I, I definitely remember being inspired by uh, was John McCain. Because I remember when I first went in uh, for leukemia therapy, I, I knew it was going to be pretty much a, a solitary existence. Basically, when you go in for leukemia therapy, you have to... Um, you have to make sure that anybody who comes to see you wears a mask. My kids actually could not come in the hospital room for a long time. They had to wave at me outside through the, the window because um, if, you, if you have anybody come in when your white counts are down and they sneeze on you or they have an infectious disease, you can die. In fact, most leukemia patients don't die of leukemia. They die of an infection that they pick up when they're outside the hospital or even in the hospital. And so it was, I knew it was going to be a solitary existence. And I knew it was going to go on for about 18 months. And I was wondering how I was going to cope with it. And then I read, just out of the blue, I read John McCain's book on his um, incarceration in Vietnam. And when I was reading, I, I actually went to the bookstore thinking I was going to buy some books and CDs before I actually entered into the hospital. And I just picked it up on a lark. And I, I, I got into the hospital. I started reading it. And I guess I was sort of feeling sorry for myself when I was reading it. Uh, and then I started to read it, and I said, wait a minute, this guy was in, this guy <laughs> got shot down over North Vietnam. He then went on to be in solitary confinement for almost five years. You know, what am I doing here complaining that I'm sitting in a hospital and I've got CNN, DVDs, computer, and the internet? The only way he could even talk to anybody for the first three years was by Morse code and tapping. And he had a broken leg. And I thought, you know, I think I should quit complaining and, and uh, <laughs> just take his experience and say, you know, you know, if he can do it, I can do it because I'm a lot better off than he is. So I found that really inspirational. Another guy that I find inspirational is really one of my best friends, if not my best friend. His name is Matt Thomas. Um, he was a uh, um, uh, orphan uh, in Japan. His, uh, he was orphaned. He was uh, the son of a, uh, a Japanese woman and an American uh, serviceman. And uh, he was orphaned in Japan early on. 
and uh, he had to grow up in an orphanage, and he, he, he was small, he got beat up a lot, and he actually learned to fight there. He tried to escape several times. He was finally adopted by another American serviceman and, uh, and his wife, and uh, he moved to California. And he grew up uh, in California as a half Japanese and half uh, American, um, but he was, he was incredibly resilient. He studied on his own. He got into Stanford on a scholarship. He didn't have any money to live on. He actually built a treehouse in the, the woods behind Stanford and lived in a treehouse for his first three and a half years until the president of the university discovered the treehouse and had it knocked down. Uh, he then graduated from Stanford. He went on to Harvard Medical School. Uh, he, he didn't like medicine, and so he actually left medicine and went into government service. He was in um, government service both in um, uh, clandestine service as well as a military service for many years, uh, was a, a patriot that served his country on many, many missions. He, he later went on, and how I got to meet him was he was my twin brother's bodyguard. And uh, when my, uh, my brother was a federal judge, and uh, he also um, is my uh, kids martial artist instructor. He developed a class called Model Mugging that uh, has now trained literally 100,000 women on self-defense, how to win a street fight, not strict martial arts, but if you're attacked on the street, either with someone by someone who's armed or unarmed, um, all of his tools and techniques are about how to win that street fight. And it's got an amazing track record. I've actually taken the class three or four times along with my 17-year-old daughter, and it's an amazing class. And I, I find him really inspirational, uh, all the things that he's done. You know, I often think that, that, that people who are inspirational um, it's, it's more about what they've overcome than what they've done. And, and both McCain and, uh, and uh, my friend Matt Thomas have overcome a lot. And I would also say that the same thing about my twin brother, who's a major source of inspiration. You know, uh, both him and I grew up from modest background. And I remember when he was a federal judge making something like $90,000 a year in Oklahoma. I remember him being in debt and wondering if he'd ever get out of debt, and, and I, I felt sorry for him because he devoted his life to, to civil service. But when he finally got out of civil service and went into private practice, he was rewarded with an incredible career. He's been you know, amazingly successful. He's done fantastic, uh, not only from a money standpoint, but being a great father to his two sons and to his daughter. And he, he really overcame a, an incredibly modest background to go on to become really one of the nation's, if not the world's, best mediator of complex lawsuits. So those are three people that inspire me a lot. Do you, do you listen to any music when you work? Well, remember my work has sort of two components. One part of it is that I'm actually involved in speaking, platform speaking, so I can't listen to music then, although I play music when I, I do platform speaking. I have a bunch of really cool songs that support the content that I teach. You'll have to see them sometime. Cruel to be kind is one of them. Um, but the, uh, the times when I'm writing, I do listen to music, and uh, I listen to music that constantly when I'm riding either on planes or in my home office, it's, it's a, a great soothing way to sort of stay relaxed as you work. Do you follow any routine to sleep? You know, I, I sort of fell into a, a habit when I was in the hospital in, in 2006, 2007 of taking a, uh, an allergy medication called Benadryl. It, it's, it's over the counter. It just makes you drowsy and you go to sleep. And I find that that really helps me. And so I, I still take Benadryl. I've sort of carried that tradition on ever since 2006. What are the things that makes you really happy? Ah, well, I mean, being with my children, first of all, Anya and Cole, and, and the context in which I'm, I'm with them. I mean, we, we're fans of Africa, we're lovers of Africa. I've personally been to Africa on safari maybe 15, uh, maybe 20 times. I've not even added it up. My kids have been with me four or five times. We just love, love trekking through the hills of Africa, being together, being alone. And we also love sports together. We, we, uh, we love being on the squash court with a great squash player like yourself, or alternatively, my friend Rod Isles, who's uh, the former world uh, champion. Uh, also, my, my friends locally here, Rocky Carson, who's um, not a squash player per se. He's actually, actually the world's number one racquetball player, but he's a heck of a squash player as well, as you can imagine. And so we just love doing sports together and being together with great athletes. We, we love all kinds of sports. Oh, same thing applies to golf as well. So, you know, being with the kids, playing sports, walking around Africa, uh, being with being with, with great people. I mean, one of the reasons that 
that uh, I so enjoyed my time with you is you, you're a fantastic squash player, but you're also an intellect and you're an entrepreneur. And I like spending time with, with great people. Um, and so that, that's really, that's what makes me happy. Thank you so much. Last question, how people can contact you? Yeah, so my website is at reinventures.com, and uh, you can just go directly to reinventures.com, or you can contact me directly via lphillips at reinventures.com. That's my email address, and that's actually posted on the website as well. So uh, we, we named the company Reinventures because we found that much of the work we were doing actually had to do with reinventing an enterprise. And sometimes it was a very large scale enterprise and you had to bring an entrepreneurial mindset, a venture mindset to that reinvention task. So thus the name reinventures. So uh, check me out on reinventures.com and send me uh, comments or thoughts or reflections on our interview today. Thank you so much for, for the amazing time and interview and information, Dr. Len. Really appreciate it. Hey, it's great. I look forward to seeing you in the United Arab Emirates again soon, my friend. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everyone. Be efficient, stay efficient, and see you soon with another leading expert.